Welcome to Speaking of Pictures, a conversation on our work by four painters represented by the Bowery Gallery in New York. During this period of the gallery's closure, we're trying to maintain the conversation about painting that would usually arise from exhibitions in the gallery space. In our own previous uh, conversation a few weeks ago titled Varieties of Landscape Space, each of us discussed paintings by artists who've affected us. Tonight, we'll try to unpack some of the ways we respond in landscapes or cityscapes to the world around us and to the artists whose works formed us and continue to inform us through their paintings. We are in alphabetical order. Simon Carr, a New York painter and professor at the MCC. John Goodrich, a painter, a writer on art and professor of various institutions. Najib Nahas, a painter who lives and works in Brooklyn. And me, Deborah Rosenthal, I'm a New York painter and writer on art and former professor. So we are uh, going to proceed in anti-alphabetical order. So I will, uh, having last name beginning with R, I'll go first. So may I have the first image, please? I'm going to talk about some of my paintings on landscape themes from the past decade. I've lived part of each year uh, for the last 17 years or so on an old farm in the, the foothills of the Catskills. The house is mountainous, woody, and uh, cleared field setting induced me to compose landscapes. For me as an abstractionist though, what stirs me in the country setting are myriad sensations, evidence of so many different dichotomies and opposing forces rather than things in nature, out of which one might make a painting. Fast, for instance, fast and slow, a flowing river, but also an immovable mountain. Uh, the rhythms of worked earth and their seemingly neat divisions. Hard and soft, the enormous rocks I see around me and the light as air shapes of soft clouds, which sometimes echo the rock shapes. Opposing light sources, reflection versus shadow, forms seen from near and from far. Um, and there are things sensed but unseen rustlings, the flight of birds, the things between blades of grass, tiny teeming creatures, minnows in a pond. These are some though not all of the kinds of things and forces I sense as I look around me in the country. How to make a painting out of these dichotomies, these sensations, really empirical observations, which sometimes contradict what we know. I set up this painting called Uphill and Down as a square whose main division, instead of the horizon line dividing earth from sky, is divided vertically through the whole length of the painting, almost the whole length of the painting. There's no visible sky. It's been superseded by this outsized vertical hill form um, as, if you, as if we were at the base of this mountain or hill with its height blotting out the sky beyond it. The horizon line is there for comparison, but it's been attenuated to a little line uh, over on the right, uh, right hand periphery, of, right hand margin of the painting. Um, there is no foreground, middle ground or background in this painting, nor is there generally speaking in my landscapes. I divided this central hill into black and almost white. It looks white in the slide, of course, but it's not quite white to strike a note of singularity about this, this form. Uh, and to hold the frontal plane, but it's the only such opposition, this absolute opposition, in a tonal, otherwise tonal, mineral colored painting. But the two sides of that black and white form feel as different as the sensation of straining to go up a hill uh, and the ease versus the ease of walking down the other side. And opposed to this in initial enormous dichotomy, the forms on either side of it display the theme and variations kind of repeating habit of nature. So many rhyming near triangles of hills, reminding us even of the multiplication of plant forms, pulling a million identical weeds, for instance, but also of animal forms which repeat with variations. So the painting is a little poem about identity and otherness, in this case, in the mineral world. Um, can I have the next, please? The art historian Kenneth Clark wrote this about the origins of landscape painting, quote, we are surrounded with things which we have not made and which have a life and structure different from our own, trees, flowers, grasses, rivers, hills, clouds, unquote. 
His comment jibes with the belief that some have that abstraction develops its roots and its raison d'etre in the genre of landscape because abstractions and landscapes aren't figure compositions. That's true, but um, perhaps for some kinds of abstraction, this was or is true. But I found that some of the landscape painting that's spoken to me the most over the years are the mythological or allegorical landscapes of Claude Lorrain and Nicolas Poussin, which of course include figures who are key to the mood and the meaning of their landscapes. These often, figure, these often feature a figure who's contemplating a landscape, uh, lying down or sitting down um, and looking into the landscape. In this painting of mine called June or What I Thought I Knew, I've got familiar forms familiar to me, rocks, a house, cloud shapes from my own setting, which I see every day. Two figures stand and sit in two different locations, one peering outward and back through space as if through a window or door, and the other one contemplative, um, looking as it were inward. The central division again is a tilted vertical, an upended horizon line, a vertical set into motion clockwise or counterclockwise. And the pervasive enveloping blue of the painting is the blue haze of atmospheric perspective. In other words, all parts of the painting are located in some kind of distance, a distance of time, that is, it's a painting about memory. Can I have the next, please? Um, this is a painting that is um, uh, a little joke in a way, a little painting joke. Um, it's called Landscape in the Studio. And um, it, it features uh, a, an almost monotone uh, tonal landscape um, above and this cascade of uh, saturated colors um, coming down through the painting related to the forms above it. And um, this is something that uh, harks back a little bit to Jean Elion's uh, late paintings of artists working in this working in the life studio from a live model and uh on the on their easel is a, a total abstraction so it's a little sort of um play about um how landscape is really transformation and it's a joke on us abstractionists who completely transform i guess um and so the, the painter stands at the left-hand edge, almost out of the painting, his easel over on the right. Next, please. In the last few years, I've been doing a lot of paintings in gouache on paper. And this, for me, is something of a, a sort of odd return to printmaking, which I always did in black and white. But the idea of a painting um, that is composed of hatching, cross-hatching, um, has interested me in terms of in terms of thinking about the plane, the frontal plane that I always go back to or go forward with, um, and the idea of of forms entirely composed of lines, so that there is a a, a confusion, a a, a a collision between the idea of contour and the idea of a plane, the interior of a plane. Planes that are built out of lines, lines that uh, um, ultimately may read as planes. It, there's a kind of ambiguous flutter of space back and forth or a sort of pulsing of space back and forth. The reclining figure is, is uh, not quite a quotation, but a little homage to river god figures and um, other recumbent figures like tomb figures that I've been drawing from in Europe for a number of years. Um, I, I realized that um, so many of the paintings that I've done of these mountainous landscapes have a figure lying down and a figure standing up. In this painting, there's a figure lying down, no, no standing figure. But um, the, the idea that um, the horizon is, as Paul Clay put it, too reasonable. Um, that what you expect is that we are verticals on the flat earth. And of course, we know better than that. 
So um, the figure, the figure becomes a stand-in for the artist, clearly a stand-in for the person contemplating the landscape, but also a kind of index of vertical to horizontal, um, which reverberates throughout a space that um, from edge to edge in a space like this. Um, for me, the different densities that I get with uh, hatching uh, become the way that I build a space. It's a space that comes forward and comes more forward um, and sort of uh, oscillates back and forth between those locations. Next, please. Can I have the next image, please? Thank you. Uh, this is this is entitled the crystalline type, and it's a it's a uh, title I took from a phrase in Paul Clay's diaries. Um, he's a painter who means a huge amount to me. Um, as a young man, he wonders he wonders aloud in his diaries whether he has become he is becoming the crystalline type, and I think what that means is something about a kind of rigidity in composition rigidity of geometry that, um, for instance, the regular intervals of crystal molecules uh, will display. And I think he did not see abstraction that way, nor do I. Um, but it's one aspect of one kind of abstraction, and it can be played off as a foil for other things. So here I have um, one section over sort of to just right of center, um, where the regularity of the network of cross-hatching freezes into a kind of crystalline uh, structure. But the figures, uh, the standing figure on the right-hand side of the painting, and the sort of swoosh of a figure, a re recumbent figure on the left, um, are opposed to that and exist in their own kind of densities of space. Um, line, line, line into plane, line as color, um, color as plane, color as line. These are the sort of shifting ambiguities back and forth that I think match my um, my desire to to find forces in nature rather than um, solely things. And I want to just end with a quotation from, of all people, Pascal, um, who wrote in the 17th century, uh, nature is a sphere whose center is everywhere and whose circumference is nowhere. So chew on that a little bit. Okay. Thank you. Thank you that I'm sharing are part of a series of Manhattan street views that I started in 2017. This is a view of Ninth Avenue looking north from around 30th Street. The building near the center of the image is where I was employed between 2006 and 2016. The painting is based on a detail of a photograph that I took in 2014 on my way back to the office one afternoon. The image resonated with me for two reasons. The first is by 2018 when I painted this picture, the company I worked for had moved to the east side so that the daily walks that I used to take every afternoon to Chelsea were a memory. The second is that in the intervening years, like much of the West Side, the place itself had changed radically. In fact, if one were to stand today where this man and his little dog are standing, they would see a significantly different cityscape. The building where I used to work is no more, and whatever urban grittiness the place had, and which I tried to convey in this picture, it has no more. The spatial organization of the image generally follows the spatial structure of the photograph on which it's based. There is this funnel dictated by the linear perspective in which we're viewing from the right side. I tend to make some adjustments during the drawing process. I don't know how much these adjustments can be considered distortions. They consist in straightening vertical and horizontal planes, modifying the, the angle of some of the diagonal planes, changing the scale of some of the objects in the foreground, and slightly increasing the scale of things in the middle and background, moving things a little to the right or to the left, or taking them out altogether. Light. Me painting is primarily about establishing a pictorial light, a certain overall tonality, and keying the, col the colors accordingly. 
In painting this image, I consciously try to attenuate the effects of the natural light and make the pictorial light grayer and more somber than what the photograph had mechanically captured. There is also, this is also the greatest change between my recent work and what I had been doing for the previous 15 years. Whereas in my previous work, I relied on the brightness and saturation of colors to achieve a light that I felt was radiant and celebratory. In the current paintings, I use colors in more measured or restrained manner. The images are intentionally expressed in tones and shades and in nuances of gray. Subjectively, I think this light conveys a more sober tenor, which feels truer to me in relation to the urban motifs that I'm currently painting. This is a picture of 11th Avenue near 19th Street facing north. It depicts the place where two postmodern structures meet. The one on the right with the facade made up of multiple mirrors is by Frank Gehry. The whitish one near the center with the irregular floors and windows is by Jean Nouvel. 19th Street is where these two buildings meet. Sky. The dark clouds and spotlights in the paintings in the painting are liberties that I took with a source image. They are not pure inventions though, rather they are a, a recollection of a stormy sky that I had encountered one afternoon not, not too far from this location. There were these big dark clouds that seemed to announce a heavy storm and at different intervals within them, rays of sunlight broke through and lit different parts of the cityscape. So that's the general idea here. Details, a lot of the labor in this painting was working out the details, in particular drawing out the reflections on the different mirrors that make up the facade of the Gary building. These reflected fragments of trees, clouds, cars, sidewalk, asphalt, and other structures. Each mirror moves at a different angle and reflects a different view. I think this continuity and irregularity are part of the meanings that these two buildings represent, ideas of random rhythm and unpredictability. Compare them to the regular patterns of most buildings, like that building with the horizontal stripes in the, book, in the, in the background, for example. Light. The central formal issue in this painting was keying the tones to the light that I had conceived, one small patch at a time, harmonizing one tone with another, one mass with another, knowing where the brightest whites should be and how all the other whites had to be cut down while maintaining their whiteness, sorting out slate grays from bluish grays, from purplish grays, yellowish grays from umberish grays and greenish grays, etc. The anchor in the process are the values. Values are the backbone around which hues and temperatures are organized. And gradually, in small modules and small details, the image constructed itself. This is a view of Lexington Avenue from 53rd Street facing south, a couple of blocks from where the company that I work for moved in 2017. The skyscraper against the whitest sky in the background is the Chrysler Building. Geometry. What initially attracted me to this arrangement was the clear geometric structure of the space. It's an archetypical view that one sees in Midtown Manhattan. There is this big recession, this funnel that converges here from left to right along the side planes of the buildings as they move diagonally into space, as well as the inward movement of the ground planes of the street and sidewalk as they converge onto the horizon. Then there are these frontal planes which break the receding movements at different intervals and reestablish a relation to the picture plane. Within this geometric matrix, there are all these incidental details, traffic signs, crosswalks, moving cars and trucks, pedestrians, and the occasional messenger on his bike. On the right, there are these two big posters advertising who designed the restaurant behind them and with whom the chef had studied. Joël Robuchon, the man with the most missioned stars in the world. Pictorial light. As in all the other pictures, the painting is about constructing the pictorial light, the tonality of the image. In the foreground, the forms are mostly in shadow and lit by reflected lights, whereas in the background, there is some direct sunlight that is softened by a thin atmosphere. A lot of the work is technical. How gray can you make a gray while keeping some recognizable color in it? How different can you make one white from another while keeping its fundamental whiteness? These are the concerns that are the most interesting part of painting for me. Things that are decided on the palette and tested on the picture, then corrected and tested again, etc. So although one has a general idea about the relations of the big masses that compose a pictorial image, it ultimately comes down to small calibrations and little patches that are placed sometimes tentatively and sometimes more decisively 
until the image is completely painted. It really comes down to details. The thing that struck me most when the company that I worked for moved from the west side to the east side of Midtown was the difference between these two urban environments. Whereas the west side between Hell's Kitchen and Chelsea still maintained traces of its gritty past that were, be that were being fast replaced by flashy new structures, the east side had a very different and much more established look and feel to it. Park Avenue, Fifth Avenue, 57th Street, 59th Street, there's a majesty or grandeur to the architectural environment that typifies this part of Midtown. And it is this contrast between the two neighborhoods that sort of inspired me to want to paint images of the city. The clear recognition that Manhattan is not one, but many different places and can be a source of many different contents or, meeting, or meanings. This is a view of Park Avenue from 53rd Street face, facing south. You have this cluster of high rises, each with a different shape, all variations on, the base, on basic geometric masses, primarily the block or cube and yet each with its own sort of architectural identity. And like much of Midtown, or are aligned in a, disciplined, in a disciplined way along the orthogonals that the streets and avenues impose. So there are these ideas of order and uniformity. There is also a grandeur or majesty which the architectural environment contains. And part of that grandeur is related to scale. Walking down a street or avenue in this part of Midtown is like being at the bottom of these impressive man-made canyons. And I think that this is part of what I was trying to represent in this picture. Verticals only. One thing that is different in this picture than all the other images of the city that I have painted so far is that it has no horizontal plane. There are just upright planes that are either directly facing us or receding diagonally. There is a big terrace, almost half a block deep, behind the wall in the foreground but the wall conceals it. And with the exception of the very bottom of the picture by where the young woman in the foreground is walking, everything is above our eye level. Details. Within my limited drawing ability, I tried to render some of the details of the facades of the various buildings. And while I did not count the actual number of windows or floors, I tried to account for their overall quantity. It is part of the total effect of the place. All these small squares, rectangles, and stripes that one sees at a glance. But when you come to paint them, you have to do it one at a time, which is not very easy to do when you are impatient and have a shaky hand and would much rather block the thing with big brushes and have some fun painting. Art sometimes makes us do things that we would not naturally do or want to do. But in developing a picture, we have to follow its own logic. This is a picture of 2nd Avenue near 31st Street in Kipps Bay on the east side. It's a neighborhood that I'm less familiar with than the other places that I have painted so far. It's a pleasant part of the city with a number of residential high rises. The space in this image is again determined by the spatial organization of the place which the photograph had captured. It's a structure, it is structured a little like the interior of a box or a roofless room. The main adjustments or distortions that I performed are related to making the vertical planes in the back more frontal and parallel to the picture plane than what they actually were in the source photograph. Colors and light. I tried in this picture to play the colors against each, other's, against each other. Some juxtapositions are bold. Black against white, white against blue, blue against orange, orange against green, while others are more tempered and subtle. A cool bluish gray next to a warm yellowish gray, a slate gray next to a neutral gray, a greenish gray next to a brownish or violet gray, etc. The light is meant to represent a late afternoon in an urban setting, maybe on a Saturday or Sunday in September. There is something special about late afternoon, even though in reality the sunlight is weaker, its presence is somehow more evident. It also tends to present the color of things in a more radiant guise. So in conclusion, the city can be gritty, it can be grand, it can seem alienating, but can also be warm. It can be hyperdynamic, but it can also be made to look placid and all still. It's a complex subject with many faces. And I think that this is the exciting thing for me and what moves me to want to continue the series. And that's it for me. <coughs> oh, oh, well, thanks, uh, Najib. I guess it's, it's my turn now. Um, and uh, I'll show five works. They're all from my Bowery show uh, last February. And for me, it was kind of a milestone. It was my 10th show at Bowery. It was uh, uh, 
the, the time of my 65th birthday, so I'm now on Medicare, and I figured out it was also about the exact point at which half my life I'd spent in the Bowery Gallery. So I had a bunch of milestones all together. Uh, so time, time has flown. Um, my, my very first show, I remember thinking I was going to do the best I could. I wasn't going to use the most uh, valuable materials or do the most complex uh, compositions. I just wanted to proceed with learning to paint. I was still learning. And I thought, well, eventually I'll use better materials, try more complicated things. And, and I never did. So it turned out painting remain, remains elusive and complex and challenging. And so after 10 shows, I'm still trying to find out exactly what painting is. I think I'm closer, uh, and, and for me, the, the measure of my touchstone would be various masters. I like Corot, Courbet, Watteau, Chardin, and so forth. Um, I remember at my very first show telling Nancy Prusnowski that my paintings were probably maybe a hundredth as good as Corot, but they cost about a thousandth as much. So they were actually a bargain in that respect. I think I'm getting better, but I still have a ways to go. Um, I, I do feel painting, you're trying to make something real when you're painting something uh, representational. And real doesn't mean um, getting the natural uh, proportions or the uh, natural colors or every detail. Real means achieving something within the language of painting, using lines and forms to add up to something more than uh, a, a number of details. Um, so painting is not photographic, and I think all our eyes now are so accustomed to photographs, the photographic image, it's hard to see painting, hard to see a, a, a painting where every, an image or every single element's put there deliberately, and not plotted automatically. Um, and and it, it amounts to more than getting the correct perspective, more than getting the right volumes and details. And I, and I have a quote from Kenneth Clark too, which I think is a, a, a very nice, statement about the real. Kenneth Clark in 1960 in his book Looking at Pictures said, no reasonable person can still believe that limitation, I'm sorry, imitation is the end of art. To do so is like saying that the writing of history consists in recording all the known facts. Every creative activity of the human race depends on selection and selection implies both the power to perceive relationships and existence of a pre-established pattern in the mind. And it's true, we, we recognize things almost instantly. We assign our expectations when you see a tree, a chair, a table, a car, a person, whatever. And so much of the challenge of painting, of seeing as an artist, is to actually see things for what they are, not, not our idea of how they should be. Um, the cliche in art school, I think it's a true one actually, is that lines divide a surface and direct the eye about, about, a, about that surface. Colors fill it with various weights. I like to think that drawing starts a journey around the canvas and the color fulfills its promise. It waits this area, gets a bit elusive here, holds here, resolves the gestures. So colors in short provide rhythmic reason for the journey initiated by drawing. Uh, if you're painting something, you want to make sure you get the overall disposition of masses. And if you're outdoors and you get like this uh, landform stretching the horizon, possibly water too, uh, this great dome of the sky above, objects placed at various points, and you hope to make that real rhythmically. Um, every painting is an invention. You're using a language of painting to try and make things real within that, that flat, fixed, finite world that, that is, is a painting. Uh, and I do feel that that's what the greatest painters did. That's what they did most articulately. Uh, Corot was one of my favorites. I think he surpasses Daubigny in the way that he makes, gets the momentum of, of, of gesture and how they resolve into detail. Or Seurat uh, surpasses uh, Signac, both of course pointless painters, and yet Seurat gives you some, something kind of monumental in the way, as does the crew, and, and again, uh, they, they resolve in, in uh, details. Rembrandt surpasses his students, and then Nicolas Samas and others, and again, it's because there's a uh, rhythmic, uh, uh, a power to it. So the momentous about the big forms, something telling about how he goes from those big forms and arrives at the details. Managed to get the big and the small and all to fit together in one unfolding story, if you like, one pictorial adventure. Um, now, so about my own work, 
it's not not very wise to address your own work after talking about Rembrandt and Corot and so forth. But um, this is one of the paintings I've done, and uh, I do feel paintings should speak for themselves. I'll make one uh, allowance, which is that colors don't show very well on the screen. So I hope you'll take my word for it. The colors are actually doing something a bit more than being pretty or, or uh, attractive. They actually are waiting portions of space. They're waiting their locations. So there's something going on which may not be totally apparent in these. Uh, but this is, this is a painting I did in Maine. It's 12 by 16. It's actually an oil painting on uh, Arches oil paper, which is really interesting stuff. I'd advise oil paper, oil painters to try it because you may end up with a sort of watercolor technique while being able to still go opaque and dense with the uh, dark colors if you wish. So you get this interesting kind of atmospheric effect of watercolor, that fluid look, but also the density of oil paint. Um, and I hope to get, you know, the vastness of the scene, the concision of little details in the front, you know, that march of horizontals across rocks and rocks back to the sky. And I believe that is the distant horizon at the top there. Um, uh, if I could have the next slide, please. Uh, the last couple of shows I've done at Bowery, I've, I've tried to make use of the masters. In this case, Cloud the Rain. I used Rembrandt for my previous show a few years before. And I spent the time, actually, I, I did it with, with Simon. We, we were both copying uh, masters at the Met back in the 70s, many years ago. It's a very rewarding thing uh, because you're inside, uh, hopefully inside the mind of a great painter and kind of working around inside, trying to see what his intentions were, the intention of this color here, this patch here, and so forth. And it mostly eludes you, but sometimes you, you begin to think, oh, it needs this here. And, oh, yeah, he did do that there. And that allows this to go like this and this to hold here and so forth. Uh, so I got back to doing interpretations of the masters with paintings like this. Uh, this is after one of those Claude Lorraine ink drawings, which you probably all know about. There, there are those very fluid, wonderfully uh, mysterious tonal drawings he did in ink wash. Um, which he did from, from life, I believe. They certainly have the feeling of life viewed freshly with a splash of light coming down. Quite different from the paintings where things look more uh, managed and idealized. There's a real immediacy to those uh, ink wash uh, drawings. I tried to capture that here along with his sense of monumentality. I changed it in a couple ways. I added color. I imagined being next to him, if you like, while he was painting it. Uh, and and Trees are the same, paths are the same, houses are somewhat the same since then. So those visual sensations, that visual world that he was in, we are still in. We're still humans. I hope to get, you know, uh, an echo of what he was trying to do, only done in color and then much bigger. So this is actually five feet across. So there's an exercise was using uh, Claude Lorraine as a starting point. So I'm trying to get the, the uh, expansiveness of his it was a little drawing of his, the feeling of sprouting forms arising from the earth at various distances, I'm trying to get the vitality of the scene that he put so powerfully into that little drawing of his. Um, the next slide, please. Um, uh, and I'd like to make another quote from uh, Kenneth Clark, and this is from his uh, his. Uh, essay on Las Meninas, which is a wonderful essay, and if you Google it, I, I, would, I would I would definitely do that. He said during that, uh, looking at the painting, he would start as far away as he could, where the illusion was complete, and I'd come gradually nearer until suddenly what had been a hand and a ribbon and a piece of velvet dissolved into a salad of beautiful brushstrokes. I thought I might learn something if I could watch the moment at which this transformation took place but it proved to me as elusive as the moment between waking and sleeping. I think it's a wonderful description because he's clear, clearly cued into the painting and experiencing it, but then it changes. It goes from being either abstract patches of color when he's up close to objects, depicted objects. And my feeling is it's kind of the view of a non-painter, a very articulate, passionate uh, art historian. And the view of the painter would be of course, it's a patch of paint, and it is an object all at once. And so there's this continuity, this funny parallel life happening on the canvas, which relates to the bigger life beyond. Every patch is color. It's, it's an abstract little force, but it's also part of uh, a gathering image of, of real life. 
So the two are parallel and proceed together and in this very complex way. So, so that passage from Kenneth Clark kind of tells me that uh, you want to walk through that dory between abstraction and representation and you have to build at the same time. Very hard to do, it's why painting is so exhausting, I think. Um, another painting from Maine, this is actually on a canvas board, I think, uh, but I'm trying to get, again, the bigness of a scene and making details purposeful, counting rhythmically within that unfolding hole. Uh, next one, please. And another one this is on the arches oil paper. Uh, I do like the sensation of us being in the grip of forces, uh, gravity, and we're so used to it, it's hard to imagine without it, but it very usefully locates us on a flat surface. That surface spreads out if you're next to a body of water. Of course, that body of water is totally flat, virtually totally flat because of the gravity. Gravity unleashes these big product sensations, and it's revealed in light, that second force where we're subject to. The light descends on objects rising to resist gravity. So you get the sensation of things rising against gravity into the light. Uh, and I use that a lot in classes, hoping to get, think of the, the force of light as an organizing factor. Uh, Stanley Lewis uh, once said that Crow invented a new way of making space and using light. And I think what he meant that Corot, unlike Claude Lorraine, got the contradictions of a, of a particular light. So that things in a distance might be brighter and warmer than things in the foreground. But, but I, I tell students to try and do that, to get the contradictions of light and use that as a way of making a dynamic image. Uh, next one, please. Oh, and another one from Maine. Uh, ordinary objects can become intriguing. <laughs> I guess beautiful even, and I can resist the word beautiful because I don't want to be trafficking in charm. <laughs> I want things to have character and be vital within their own visual terms. Big, a little house made small because of distance, of a bigger uh, part of sand in the foreground, and it's just played between the two. Um, the ground plane is always uh, measured out by horizontals, shadows, little patches of lighter and darker areas. What I hope to do to give a sense of scale of, of objects mattering within that. Um, I'll, I'll quote, by way of winding up, I'll quote Courbet. Um, and he said in 1955, when he staged that big show, I believe he'd been denied, denied a show in the usual, uh, in probably the, the Academy Francaise, so he staged his own show in a big tent. And this is what he said in the publicity for it. I've studied the art of the ancients and the art of the moderns, avoiding any preconceived system and without prejudice. I no longer wanted to imitate the one than to copy the other. I simply wanted to draw forth from the complete acquaintance with tradition, reason, and independent consciousness of my own individuality to know in order to do. That was my idea. And um, it's interesting to me that Matisse actually paraphrased that. Matisse, uh, as we all know, had a school for a while, and it was not a very satisfying experience. I think he had it for about three years, something like that. And actually, some pretty good painters came out of it. But what we said was so depressing about it was that they were all trying to be Matisse. They'd gone to Matisse school to be Matisse. And he found that really distressing. And this is what he said about the experience. I took pains to inculcate in them, his students, a sense of tradition. Needless to, needless to say, many of my students were disappointed to see that a master of the reputation for being revolutionary, as himself, could have repeated the words of Corbet to them. I simply wish to assert a reason and independent view of my own individuality within a total knowledge of tradition. So it's interesting to me that so radical painter as Matisse in his own time, uh, he didn't feel overwhelmed by tradition. He felt challenged by it. He felt he could use it to his own needs. I think it told him what, what painting could be. You know what better example than what's, what's in the museums. And I'm going to close with one final Matisse quote. Uh, this is from Notes of the Painter in 1908, and he said, uh, uh, I think it nicely summarizes uh, what one way of looking at a painting that I empathize with. He said, expression to my way of thinking does not consist of the passion mirrored upon a human face or betrayed by a violent gesture. The whole arrangement of my picture is expressive. The place occupied by figures or objects, the empty spaces around them, the proportions, everything plays a part. Composition is the art of arranging in a decorative manner the various elements at the painter's disposal for the expression of his feelings. And that's it.
I'm gonna rip. So I tried to, I wanted to give a sense, uh, not so much a historical sense or not so much a general sense of what I do, um, as much to try to give an immediate sense of what's going on right now. I mean, it was a sort of a way of disorienting myself in a way of throwing myself off base. The, the temptation with these things always is, you know, here's what painting is, here's what I believe and all that kind of stuff. I, 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 I'm, the paintings I'm worth, these paintings from the summer, these are all drawings, paintings from the last uh, couple of months. Um, I'm right in the middle of them, so I don't know. You know, are they good, are they bad, or am I gonna tear them apart again, or whatever. But I wanted to try to get a sense of what, what I'm asking them to do, or what I'm demanding them, demanding of them, um, to give a sense of what the things are that are important to me, or what the things are that are, that are important, and what I'm trying to bring out through experience, um, through the paintings themselves. So, um, one of the most important elements has become one of the most, and always was, I guess, um, is drawing. Um, I draw a lot. Um, I draw from life. I draw from photos if I have to. Um, the tractor on the top right is a tractor I knew very well as a child, but uh, you don't see them anymore, so I had to use an old photo. Um, the horses are the horses out in the feet, you know, that I clean up after every day. Um, and there's me cleaning up. Um, the tractor, you know, it, it, it's, it's hard to explain this place because it's so deeply ingrained in me. I can't really, but, I, but I'm hoping that by presenting the paintings this way, um, you can get a sense of the depth of the experience. If you pay attention to that little drawing, it's just a little sketch um, on the lower left. Um, that comes from standing on a hill. I was standing on a hill waving to the guy driving the tractor I've known all my life. Um, standing there with my grandson, who was very excited um, about the tractor and about the thresher. Um, and that was that. You know, and I drew some something of that, some grain of that came with me back into the studio. Next came the drawings, um, eventually came the paintings. But it's, it's interesting to try to sort out what is, it that, what is it about the motif? What is it grabs you about the motif? I mean, it's obvious in a way because either by training or by just the force of habit, I've been doing this for so long that that's the way I think. When I look at things, I think about painting them, when I think about drawing them. Um, and if there's one wonderful thing that life has provided me in old age, um, it's the ability to at least begin to approach uh, to draw what I see, being able to draw what I see. Um, so look at that little tractor there and go to the next one. And so that's a little, it's just a little sketch of sizes right there, 24 by 30, thank you, John. Um, there it is, right? It's been changed pretty dramatically from what we saw, um, especially in the upper area and the trees and all, but that's, they're all specific memories. They're all specific memories that come out while you're working on the painting. There's no sense of transcription. There's no sense that I saw this thing, I'm gonna run back in the studio and paint just what I saw. It's just a beginning. It's just a start. Um, it's just a place to uh, sort of begin this long and complicated series of memories, associations, tactile feelings, right? What, are the, what does the, the hay feel like now that it's ripening up? What does the light feel like as it bumps through the trees like that? Um, it's a place where all those things become focused. It's a place where all those things become, can become real, right? The, the, the sense, it took me a long time to figure out, but the sense I want from the paintings is not real in detail, um, the way I just saw a movie last night about Andrew Wyatt, and I talk about details, he's pretty impressive, but he gets at it that way, but mine is more that you want it to be vivid, that you want it to be tactile, you want it to be, you want it to jump, Right? You want it to seduce you into entering the painting and then moving around all the spaces within the painting. Right? It's really a kind of a, a breath in and a breath out. Uh, go to the next one, please. Um, this is another small one. So these are all just the beginning of the summer trying to orient myself, though there are themes, themes that I've been using all along um, for many years. Um, places, um, this is just outside the window here. Um, but it's, the interesting thing is that you go after them again and again and again. Um, you, you don't let up. Um, and each day you see it, each day you, you begin to experience it again. I mean, you find a way to get into the picture. That's, that's really what, like if uh, our mutual friend Thaddeus Riddell was here, he'd, mum he'd mumble something about sand. Um, but that's really what the textures are about. And these paintings all have a lot of sand in them. Um, but that's really what the textures are about to, to make it, to try to subvert the intellectual approach of 
you know, is the horse big enough? Is the figure big enough? Wait a minute, is that the right saddle? Try to subvert that um, with this sense of something very physical, very immediate that you can't explain, right? The painting to me is all about the things you can't explain. Um, my, I, I come from a family of writers for many generations and writing really stinks because you can't do that, right? It's all about words. It's all about things you can't explain, right? Um, at least to me, right? I realize I'm making a generalization, but painting's about things you can't explain. Painting's about, even when you talk about what kind of horse is it, what kind of barn is it, is it the right tractor up there, or is the blue too blue in the mountains? There's something going on. There's something tactile, physical, and in luminosity that's going on that strikes you below the belt, that strikes you in a much more vivid way um, than rendering detail, or that it gives, it gives the paint a chance to breathe. I always feel badly when I see uh, academically rendered paintings because why would anyone do that to paint? Why would you torture paint that way? I mean, paint's got its own voice and, and if you cooperate, um, that voice can work with your voice and you can, you can make, something can happen. Um, so that's what that scumbling's all about. It's a very, I mean, if you, I, I can't say I, I invented everything in the world. John was really good about talking about antecedents. Um, there are many people who scumble. There's many people who use sand and, and all that kind of stuff. But the, the trick with the scumbling is it makes it immediate. I mean, it puts it in time. It has that, that kind of frisson that, that puts it in time as if it was being done at the moment. You can see the brush moving across. You can see all that happening. Um, anyway, these are people I know. Um, it's funny because you, when you remember, it's people you know and saw last week and it's people you know and haven't seen for a couple of months and really miss them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, is, it, is that my, my wife getting on the horse? Is my daughter getting on the horse? Is it, who knows, right? It's all, it all comes stirred together. It's all becomes part of, part of what makes the painting happen. Okay, go to the next one. Talking too much. Um, here's another one, this is a little bit bigger. Um, if I was to do this in September, I'd probably show a completely different set of paintings because the way it usually works in the summers, I build up these kinds of build up these kinds of narratives, build up these kind of scenes, um, a whole variety of them. There's regular pure landscapes, there's things that pay more attention to vehicles. Um, and then they, they start to work together into larger paintings, right? And I am the, totally a victim of the legend, totally victim of the uh, stereotype, totally a victim of the myth of the large painting. Um, you can do all the little paintings you want. For me, this is for me, right? With respect to all of the people I know who make little paintings. Um, it's got to feed into it. I, I mean, it's an academic sense of all of these sketches feeding into the big machine, right? And the big machine is going to somehow, the big painting is going to somehow take all of these experiences, take all of these bits and pieces of emotion and wind, weave them together into something enormous and what, something much more powerful. Um, what I didn't want to do was refer back to my Bowery show, which was in right before COVID, right before John's actually. Um, then those were the big paintings. These are just, these are the, this is like happening in the studio right now. And as I'm looking at it, I'm thinking, I got to go back in there and fix this. I got to go back and fix that. Um, but if you can make it work, if you can cooperate with the paint and cooperate with the event in a way, just not selfless, it's, it's sort of the biggest stuff, but if you can cooperate with the event, cooperate with the memories and the recollections and the associations, then you can find something real, right? Someone walked by the studio the other day and another person who lives up here who I've, who's younger than me actually, but I've known him since he was, well, known him his whole life. And he goes, ah, there's Uncle Doug on the tractor. And I thought, hooray, you know, I've, 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 I've managed to communicate that. I've managed that he recognized the tractor. He recognized his uncle. I mean, so it was a very, that was a nice thing. There's nobody up, um, there's really nobody else up here to talk to. So you end up getting thrilled by those kinds of recognitions. Um, the fields I change, everything's been changed. Right, the big round bales totally fascinate me and they're coming back, coming back, coming back, even though they've been long since taken away and stacked in the barnyard. Um, the fields change, there's new pieces, old pieces, trees move around. Yeah, so there's no sense of limitation that this, this particular spot can twist the horizon line up or twist the horizon line down as the needs of the painting. And that's really what I wanted to try to make, a, make sense of in this little talk was what are the needs of the painting and how do they, correspond to my needs or how do they correspond to the event? How do they correspond? When you walk in the world, you gotta ask yourself, why in the world would anybody paint tractors? All right, next, uh, I think we're getting to the end. Yeah, this is the last one. Um, 
So this is a little bit more finished. It's a little bit bigger, as you can see from the little thing there. Um, it's a little bit bigger. Um, it's maybe a month old, six weeks, something like that. And it's pretty much finished. Um, but what I like about it is it brings together all these different ideas. And you can see the way it begins. This, you know, this is a slightly larger painting that was feeding off the smaller paintings, feeding off the drawings. So in the studio, there's one, there's a wall full of drawings that, that it's literally something you can draw from, right? There's a tractor, there's a horse, there's, there's all these different positions. Um, because I don't know if you, you know, for all of you who have tried to paint horses, boy, um, there's a lot of moving parts and there's a lot of ways to, there's a lot of ways they express character and motion. Um, and you need references a lot of the time. You need drawings. Um, and I think in this one, the reason I put it in at that last minute was because looking at it the other day, I think it, it begins to make a certain kind of movement. It begins to make a certain kind of sense rhythmically and begins to make a certain kind of sense in terms of the landscape. So it's not just one of those the paintings that came before, which are just sort of sketches, right? It's just bang, this happened, bang, this happened. Um, it begins to combine, combine those things and begins to integrate them together into something that has a certain kind of a life, right? Um, you know, like everybody else, I'm haunted by my inadequacies, um, both as a draftsman and as a, an anatomist, though that might not be as important to everybody. But, um, and in this one, at least the horses feel like they're moving. At least the figures feel like they've got a gesture, right? And hopefully everything's got a gesture. Um, the farm all is the red tractor in the back. Again, I haven't seen one of those in 40 years. Um, but it, it's A, well, I don't know what, why. Um, I was going to say it's a nice red, but it, it didn't come in because it was a nice red. It came in because it was a farmall, and then it turned into a nice red and sort of bounced the rest of the picture around. And yes, the barn is really that color. Um, so there was a way to build into the painting, a way to create certain rhythms, right, to interconnect things with, with rhythm and gesture um, that hopefully begin to gel together into an overall feeling of, of thisness, an overall feeling that this event is happening. This event drags you in, brings you into the painting, just brings you all the way around and through. I mean, the biggest thing, the biggest insight that I can offer about painting, which is not much, um, is that sense of breath, right? You go, the painting pulls you in, the painting pushes you out. The painting pulls you in, pushes you out. So you, you go into the mountains, you come back up with the horse's head. You go into the mountains or you go in behind the barn and then go up into the clouds and come forward. I mean, that's, that's just fundamental. Everybody knows that. But that sense of breath, that sense of, um, you know, what Hoffman, I unfortunately quote Hoffman, um, called push and pull. It's the, it's the breath of a painting. It's alive. When you can make that happen, you can make something alive. Um, and when it's alive, then it's, then it goes, right? It's like having a kid and one day the kid's 24 and just leaves home. Goodbye. You still stay in touch, but, but they, they, they have a self-sufficiency, so hopefully, right? They can go out into the world with their own life um, through the work that you've done together. And that's about it. So I think the idea was we were gonna ask anybody if, had, if anybody had questions. Najib, can you put it back so we, yeah, right. Um, I was gonna be the one who went around looking for people. If you go to um, participants at the bottom, I don't, a lot of you are probably extremely hip with uh, Zoom. So if you go to the bottom to participants um, and click on that, then you'll see over on the right hand side, these little blue hand, you can put the blue hand up if you want. Or you can wave your hand like that. I'll just keep the I'll just keep clicking from screen to screen and try to find people. Um, just remember to turn your uh, little red microphone on uh, before you start talking. Otherwise, we'll have to all mimic not being able to hear. Which is I don't know if you guys have been using Zoom much, but we spent a lot of time doing that. Going ah, ah. questions. Come on, I don't see any little blue hands yet. Oh wait. Dina. Oh boy. Um, <laughs> I'll give it a try. So <clears throat> um, I love how in your landscapes, there is a sense of torquing the space. Everything is moving, right? My question is, and, and you keep very um, localized, yet you keep localized color, which kind of stops things along the way, gives it a different rhythm. Um, my question is, do you deliberately try to distort or torque the actual objects, like the person? The, I'm not saying you're not, your people aren't perfect. I'm just saying, do you try to 
um, make things not perfect so the eye slips past? Yeah, I think the, the most important thing is the rhythm. So if, 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 the, if the rhythm is what animates and connects everything, I think, is that where you're going? Yeah. So to get, the rhythm, to get the rhythm of the horse, to get the gesture of the horse or the gesture of the figure is more important than getting um, the details or the more specifics or the correct anatomy or whatever. Um, but you're right, you have to, it's a, it's a fine line, right? When the whole thing, if the whole thing falls apart, you lose, right? If, if everything just turns into brush marks, um, you've all seen paintings like that and you just, you lose, right? That's not a painting anymore. You have so, to be able to hold on to the representation. You have to be able to hold on to, I see this figure, I see that figure. You see what I mean? That's a really, it, that's right, that's the ground where we find each other. That's the ground where we find the yeah. viewer. So how much attention do you, do you pay to the negative space in between, um, pushing things around and when oh, do you, when do you yeah, stop I mean, seeing the objects and when do you start seeing the whole thing? Well, you see the whole thing from, I mean, it's just as real as anything else. And a lot of times by pushing on that, you make the other thing more real. Mm -hmm. um, it's a it's a language. And I mean, I used to hate saying that when I was young, you know, as if you just had this box full of images and you just rearrange them in each painting. Um, and to a certain extent, we all do that. But the vividness of it comes in a particular arrangement. And the arrangement, uh, negative space is the whole deal. Mm -hmm. I mean, negative space is what pops and makes the thing work. I mean, that's what, not to come back to Andrew Wyeth, of all people, but I saw this movie last night. And the negative, and some of them, are they're, they're really weird and that made them more fascinating, but he doesn't always get that sense that there's, a, there's this space circulating around, there's this aliveness. I think that somehow the negative space is the life of it. I mean, it's the electricity of it. It's the, it's the I don't know, it's the, mm -hmm. the unseen force. It's the unseen, you know, not to quote St. Paul, who was quoting a Greek, but where we live and move and have our being. Anybody else? I'm, I'm looking around. One of two, two of two. Questions? All right, I have a question. Um, Deborah, I wanted to ask you, um, I've never really thought as much as we have in these last few weeks going over this and looking at your work again, um, that you are using figures. But how do you fit into what Dina was just talking about? I mean, how do you think about that? Like, what, at what point the, the figure becomes a figure? At what point it becomes abstract shapes? You know, trying to find that line where there's enough figure to suggest figure, but enough abstract shapes so it integrates with the other shapes in the painting? Yeah. Um... Uh, am I unmuted, by the way? Yes, you're good. Can you, um, I don't see it. I don't see a division between the two, in a sense. I mean, I think that that um, the figure, um, generally speaking, in paintings where I have figures, um, the figures are there from the beginning, um, and I know what I want them to mean within the context of the metaphor that's building the painting, you know, in the, in the, uh, in June or what I thought I knew, the idea of a figure who turns away and a figure who turns sort of inward, you know, um, that, that was a dichotomy I started with, in fact. Um, I am a great non-believer in negative space. Um, when I hear that phrase, I generally get out my gun. <laughs> I, I mean, I know perfectly well what, people mean, but I prefer intervals or something. I've never seen a negative space. So there's only space. Um, and um, I, I don't think of the, I, I, I have constructed figures in different ways. I mean, I think of a stick figure as a nude in a way, um, stripped of flesh and muscle, right? Um, uh, or a figure made of geometric shapes ha has another sort of meaning within a metaphor. And that's, that's what I'm going on. I mean, do I push around intervals in space? I think I'm doing that, otherwise I'm not painting. I mean, of course I'm painting, but um, the space in my paintings is not a space with a foreground, middle ground, background. It's, it doesn't have, it doesn't have the, the thing that, um, Dina, you said about sort of slipping, about moving fast over a certain form. Um, 
doesn't exactly apply um, in, in my painting. And I, I think the best thing I could say about a figure and how I feel a figure can actually move freely in a painting of mine has to do with what I said about space, about den different densities and the idea that it comes for it comes forward or it's more forward. It's forward or forwarder, as I used to say to my students. And the figure somehow has to make its peace with that. And it's gone from, you know, uh, sometimes it's a stick figure, sometimes it's a it's a figure that has some modeling, sometimes it's a partial figure. Um, uh, yeah, there are a lot of figures in my paintings after all, it turns out. Chico's yeah, raising his hand. Really gonna object. <laughs> oh, Chico. Uh, hey guys, I was struck by how you all mentioned, all four of you mentioned um, private meanings that uh, you, things that were meaningful to you in your work, whether it was a walk to work or uh, a friend or a cousin in a painting or something that you were going through at the time. And yet, of course, I've only looked at these paintings without knowing any of those private meanings uh, or missing them. And I'm wondering, do you, how important is it to you? Do you think that people know the backstory? Does it add to the painting? Or are you conscious of that just being your own thing, not really connected to how your paintings are uh, viewed? Well, I, I think it has to do with sort of the savor of the painting, the taste of the painting, the sort of um, atmosphere of the painting, um, rather than, uh, you know, it's, it's not a narrative that's being laid out for you in, in explicit terms. Uh, the question is, I guess, whether the, the feeling um, that is connected with these various attachments um, somehow works its way into the palette, into the, the, the gesture of the painting, that sort of thing. I mean, I, I, I don't take that literally. I mean, um, well, and isn't there a saying that every painting is a self portrait in, in a way, because you can't help putting yourself in it. So yeah. I, I, I don't want to foreground that kind of stuff for myself. I hope to be about my subject matter, but, uh, uh, you never know how much of yourself is showing through, probably more than you intend. No, G, you're, you're on it, you're muted. Oh, oh. Okay. So now I'm unmuted. Oh, yes. uh, yeah, and I, I feel the same way. It's um, really, I was, a lot of what I tried to talk about is how the paintings or the images uh, are being produced. Uh, I was not trying to to uh, to talk about them even aesthetically. I was just trying to to explain on a very low, very kind of you know as low a level as the making of an object is. You know how how does this image come about? Well, it comes about because of this, that, and that. How I'm interested in mixing this chord, but really ultimately the it's your experience, what you just said, the way you look at it, and how you judge it, and how you you know you respond to it. That's really the important part. I was just giving. Uh, the, you know the the listener uh, how it comes about as a producer what is it you know the, the the processes that that go on in my own mind as I am producing it the only thing I can say about a picture is this is a thing this is a thing I saw or this is the thing I remembered or I mean mm -hmm. there's a sense of you're standing in front of something looking at something and I'm somehow mediating that mm -hmm. I can't I can't that's what I tried to say in the beginning I can't explain the depth of the emotion. I can't explain the depth of the associations. It's too much. It's, it's, I mean, especially in the place I'm in now, or um, I'm not in the city now, but when I'm in the city, if you can't, hopefully the painting has some sense of that depth, has some sense of that underlying, underlying emotion, underlying pressure uh, to make the picture. Yeah. But I can't, I, I can't explain it. I can't, I can't tell a backstory. I mean, I can tell a story you know, here I am upstate, blah, 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 blah. But that doesn't help the painting any, right? The painting's got to transcend not. that yeah. completely. More yeah. questions. I'm looking around, not seeing any little blue. I, I have a question. Okay, ready. I'm not quite sure. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we're good. Yes. Um, 
I wondered how your sense, how for everybody actually, how your sense of space has changed, say over the last 30 years, um, and how that sense of the dimension of the painting itself kind of has opened up or has it opened up or I'll just say for me, I find I, I want a deeper and deeper space or I want the image to kind of go way back and come way out. And that has changed a lot since say 30 years ago. Well, I, I think for me, I forgot just how subjective it is. Like sometimes the space will seem this way and then a minute later mm -hmm. seem a different way. Mm -hmm. I'm not even sure the lights changed or anything, but I, I, I couldn't be aware of how much I, I, I bring to without meaning to it's sort of the prejudices of the eye or the experience or whatever. So that's sort of alarming, but also kind of useful because you try and find what makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, I, th I, think, I think the space has become more complicated than, than I thought right. <laughs> for me. Yeah. yeah. You guys want to, Deborah or Najib? Uh, when I, when I was a kid, I was, I was a cubist. Um, I loved Picasso and I loved Brock. Um, and, you know, when I began to understand what a flat space was, in 1971, there was a Mondrian retrospective at the Guggenheim and it just hit me over the head. And I knew that I, I knew that whatever I would do would happen in, in some form of abstraction. And I have to say, um, I hate to be this way, but I don't think my idea of space has much changed over the course of my lifetime, basically, as a painter. Um, I, I think I understand better how to draw in flat space and how to, how to make a painting come off the canvas, so to speak. But my notions of space, I think I actually probably don't see in three dimensions. It's just a joke. Um, but <laughs> No, but I, I'm, I, I think I'm a primitive, actually. I mean, I, you know, I, I think my space is a primitive space, and uh, I stand by it. Um, and I, I, I actually don't feel it's changed very much. I, I mean, I think, I think, I, I, I think the paintings are sunk deeper into um, uh, the place they need to occupy as I get older. Um, you have to think that or you'd go crazy, but I think that's true. Um, but uh, the way I think about space and the, the paintings that mean the most to me from the past um, have a very powerful sense of the surface um, and things rising from and going away from the surface. Does that make sense? Yeah. Does yeah. you want to? I mean, to me, uh, when you were saying, you know, how you, you, you like now, you know, you find yourself more and more drawn to a deeper, a bigger space. I, I, I kind of feel the same way. I feel when I was younger, I was a lot more interested, you know, with the idea of plasticity, of, of push and pull, of, of flatness. And the older I get, the, the less I find that to, to be meaningful to me. The more I want to use like this illustrational deep space and, and whatever you know, it may mean or not mean, but you know, that's what I find myself more inclined to do. And I, and I try as much as possible not to be critical of, of uh, or, or not to judge it because really most of my education would have judged it. And, and I try not to judge it now. I think I'm, I'm old, I, you know, I really don't care. And so you, you do what, you know, you just do what, what you feel you, you, you know, what you feel drawn to do, which is dealing with this deep, funnel endless space and you know and try to draw out forms within it like you know an innocent child kind of thing that's this is really how yeah I, I, and and Lynette I really I think that's right um space is the magic space you know that's the thing we can walk into a painting and if I can't walk into a painting it's, it gets a lot harder um I mean my paintings that's the whole thrust the whole thrust is into the painting but then back again so that's the thing mm -hmm. with sand too is you go way deep into the picture but the sand brings you back out so you get mm -hmm. into this kind of rhythm back and forth there's I'm, you know one point perspective is dead one point perspective just takes you back to that point and the party's over you want that's not what space is about space is a throbbing living kind of a thing that you, yes. the painting should be the space in the painting should be the thing you walk you, you should be sucked into the picture and thrown around like you're inside a washing machine I mean, you should be you should be moving with the painting. 
But that all de de depends on space. That all depends on the ability to, to move in. For me, for me. Right. Well, Ron, I'm sorry. And I think that space seems to be more than a purely optical sensation. Right. If you look at yeah. something from one eye, yeah. it, it flattens. Yeah. So space yeah. is a product of your eyes and your minds making sense of your whole visual processing system as you, you know you can move through a space and things or certain distances right. or whatever. That's not purely optical. It's the whole no. experience of the uh, yeah. visual uh, yeah. systems. Yes. So you're appealing to that, but trying to make it come real in a painting, which is a fixed, I think an optical experience. So you're trying to magically make that complete experience on a fixed <laughs> version, yeah. I think. Well, Louis Finkelstein has written about that, that um, complex um, understanding when you're looking and it's psychological, it's metaphoric, it's poetic, it's visual, it's, it's so many things happening at once, right? That you're constructing those realities within, within the picture plane. Right. Yeah, no, that's, that's really the exciting part. And the, the point is you can't control them. I mean, the best thing you can do is sort of funnel them. Um, there's all those things going on and you can't say, I'm gonna take a little of this and a little of that and mix it all together and it'll be wonderful. It's all, it's surging through the picture. Um, and you're, and if you're lucky enough, you can find that place um, where they begin to balance. Mm. More questions? Mm. Wait. Mm. Wait, I'm trying You, to... by the way, Simon, Simon. Yeah. Um, you're, it, it's interesting in, in your talking about it, talking about space, in some, in some sense, you're underplaying what you do with um, the sand, which is constantly mm -hmm. to push Please. up to the front of the plane. Yep. And you've got, you've got an imminent plane there all the time that you're bouncing off of. Right. So. No, no, I agree. Admit, I, that, that was admit the to the flat plane, I say. <laughs> but Deborah, I'll have to tell the story again. You don't want to. So me and De there were me and Deborah at Aquavella looking at late Brock and getting very excited. They eventually asked us to leave. But um, I said, that's, you know, we're going, I'm going in, I'm going in, I'm going in. And that's what dying is going to be like. You're just going to, it's going to be like going into a painting and never coming back. And Deborah said, wait a minute, I paint flat. What does that mean? <laughs> and I had this sort of image of her going in, bouncing off the surface. But anyway. More questions. <laughs> no, should we should we wind up then? Hmm? Oh, uh, Chico has a question. I think oh, I'll ask a... another question. Yes, please do. So I was very struck by your comment, and I think it pertains to everybody. But uh, Simon's comment about cooperating with the paint. Um, and I can see that in your work, you know, so, but yet some are looser and some are more highly rendered. And you said, you know, you don't want to sort of um, be an academic painter who wrings the life out of the painting. And I'm wondering, uh, have you ever done that? Have you ever wrung all the life out of the I painting? Hope, Is that why you say that, Simon? No, I've painted brutally in brutally detailed ways. Um, and oddly enough, it was not when I was beginning, but, you know, down to the, the highlights and the eyeballs, but um, I, hopefully I didn't do that. Hopefully I was keeping it alive and keeping the paint alive and keeping the, the surface alive. No, I'm talking about like, I've had a lot of TAs from the uh, New York Academy and they draw, they're, whoa, the drawings can be so beautiful. Um, and then you see what they're painting and, and it's, it's like they're murdering the painting. It's, they're just... They're, they're, it's like they found a way to extract life. It's like some H.P. Lovecraft story, like extracting the life of the painting and putting it in a jar. Um, and that's, that's what I mean. It's that, and that's the, you know, you get into that whole conversation about how can photographs be useful and how can they not be useful? And no, it's just, it, it, it's like, if, if you allow yourself to do it, like when I'm painting a horse's head, I have the idea I'm gonna, he's gonna be looking that way. Then as I'm painting the head, the head starts to turn around and look another way. And which is even better, right? So that's what I mean. And and if I started with a really rigid idea of which way the horse was looking, it wouldn't. It, I wouldn't get there. I wouldn't. You wouldn't get to that quality. You know, the the dichotomy between loose and tight painting is probably 
probably should should be shelved and put back in the 19th century, perhaps. But I, you know, uh, in the fall, I was in Belgium and saw um, a row of some 20 odd uh, Rubens sketches, oil sketches. There's nothing looser than a Rubens oil sketch. And yet, and yet, um, you know, when somebody had a sort of toga thing on, you saw the highlight on the little clasp that held it at his shoulder. It was unbelievable. I mean, so that this this sort of dichotomy between detailed and and loose or whatever is it's it's a canard in a way. Um, well, it, I think exactitude is not truth, as as Delacroix said. <laughs> Um, more questions. Come on, somebody out there must be thinking, what a bunch of bozos. Objections, questions. I'll start making <laughs> Wait, I'm looking, I'm just going through this thing. You can raise your hand or you can raise your little blue hand. I think Gabriella had a question. Oh, Martha's. Oh, yeah, Martha. You gotta turn on your microphone. Microphone. Let's see. Do I have to? Uh, I hear you. Yeah. You, maybe you can do it, John. If you're. Oh, okay. Uh, I have to. Oh, uh, okay. I think I can. Oh, I'm trying to. Oh, there. You should be good. You're good to go. Okay. Now we Is got that you. you. Yeah. Now can you, you hear me. Yes. I'm just. I am. I feel like. As John said, you know, the every everything you've said makes me feel so intensely that each person's paintings are portraits of that person. That um, I'm Deborah, you as soon as I see one of your paintings, you separate me from everything else but being in your painting. You know, then this is you. I recognize it. Um, and John, I mean, I. I feel like <clears throat> your spaces are so simple and open and full of air. I mean, Fairfield Porter said, I paint air. I mean, there's, there's that sense of simplicity and a kind of strength in that form that you make that just feels very strong. And, and Simon, your, your, your jubilance and, um, just an expression of life that comes out in the color and the sort of hominess of these images. Um, mm -hmm. And Nadia, I've just, I feel like I really, for the first time, totally understand more what you're about. And it feels like when you talk about making those windows, it's almost like pieces of fabric that you're putting together. It has a, a relationship to a lot of other art forms. Anyway, I can't, I, I've had the most wonderful time listening to you. I just feel this is such a rich experience. It's not like going to a lecture of a painter talking about his work. It's, it's a much more intimate, much more real experience of hearing people talk about how they're putting together paintings. And I thank you. Oh, and maybe nice we, we meet up in the maybe we meet up in the gallery with living paintings in it soon again. You know, let's hope for that. Any gallery? Um, that seems. Is it? Are there any? Oh wait, we got one. Rita. Oh, you're muted. Oh, you're on mute. Uh, can she unmute herself? I I don't. Let me. Yeah, we're asking her to unmute. Uh, I have to go through. Okay. Them. Now we um, got. I agree with Martha. And I think that we should do more of this. We've been a gallery where we get together and we see paintings, but we haven't really gotten at intimacy with each other in dialogue. And I think these talks are doing that, which is really exciting to me. Um, so I hope uh, some of us will you know, do this too, because uh, I'm, I'm not only, understand your paintings from your point of view, but it helps me to understand what I think about what your paintings, each of you. No, I think it'd be great to, to have more people do it. Um, just give us all a chance to get together too. Um, yeah. Because you're right, you know, we would met at openings, 
We met in other galleries. Um, there was a, there was a, and we met at the museum, which I could cry. Right. Um, yeah. <laughs> But, but this is this isn't the same thing. But at least this way, we're we're getting a little more immersed in what the we're other. Thank you. Yeah. So I thank you. Thank you. No. Thank you. Wait, was that somebody making a comment? Oh, Diane has a. Thank oh, you. Oh, Diane's clapping. Oh, she's applauding. <laughs> I'm not sure. I thank you. I, I I agree. It was very very good, and I really enjoyed it. Yeah. And I would. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think that's a good point to end then. Thank you all for coming, and please, everyone. gallery members, I hope gallery members will consider doing something like this so we can all get together again. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. And thanks to everybody who came, not just gallery people, because I can see a lot of people aren't gallery people. Thank you, everybody.